Welcome to Brighter Morning with Bo, and my name is Bo Tiwari. We are so happy that you are watching today or listening on the radio, and we have a good show for you. We hope you'll have an interest in what we have to talk about. We are going to be talking with MP David Lee, the MP for Pointe Pier in the opposition, and we will be talking about energy and related matters. And we will be talking to Watson Duke. Uh, and we'll be talking about issues related to uh, the PSA and labor. But we will also be talking about Tobago, because he is also, in addition to union leader of the PSA, he is also a member of the House of Assembly and literally minority leader. Well, not necessarily minority leader, it's a 6-6. Six, six. That matter has not been resolved. So we will talk to him a little bit about that. Uh, you are watching on uh, MCTV, Multicultural TV, and you are listening on U97.5 Hot Like Pepper Radio, Multicultural Radio, and this is A Brighter Morning with Bo. Um, I, I'll just take in some things that uh, Chanel mentioned on the news. Uh, the fact that the opposition leader took the vaccine uh, publicly, I think that is good. The Prime Minister did that some time ago. He took the Sinopharm and she took the AstraZeneca, uh, two of the vaccines that are being offered, and pretty soon, with the 900,000 that have come into the country because of the generosity of the American government that will come into the country. Uh, 300,000 came uh, yesterday. Uh, people will also have the option of the Pfizer vaccines. So choice is good. And I would urge everybody to vaccinate. Uh, you now have the example of your leaders being vaccinated. Um, and uh, I think that it, you would do well to protect yourselves and to protect your family. As far as that is concerned, I wonder if I can say a word to the people of Tobago. I note uh, Chanel's news report that there are rising cases in Tobago, and especially family clusters. All right? If you are watching or listening in Tobago, let me say this thing. Let me say this to you. I mean, do you want to get infected with COVID and spread it in your family with the potential that some of your relatives might die if not you yourself? I mean, I don't think that you would want that, right? And Tobago is a small, tight-knit community. Tobago, I, I know Tobago very well. I've spent many, many uh, times every day, every year, I used to go there at least twice. Uh, with, it, with COVID, I haven't been there for about a year, but every year I still go. And I know that community very well, and I know the communities, and Tobago is made up of communities. And if you uh, get infected in a community, the way the communities are so tight and how people interact and the easy relationship with each other, the infections can really spread. With 60,000 people in a small island, you can have a real problem. So I want to urge the people of Tobago to please go out and get vaccinated. Protect yourself. You know, the, in everything that you do in life, it's a risk that you manage. It. So you have to ask yourself the question, in the worst case scenario, all right, one in a million or whatever the odds are, I don't know, you can get a vaccine and have complications and die. But the chances are pretty much less that if you are unvaccinated, you can get infected and the infection will get so bad that you will die. And you know what COVID does? It chokes you to death. You are isolated and alone. 
nobody can really come to your assistance in a fundamental way, nobody you love, nobody who cares for you or who you care, and you are choked to death. So when you weigh the risks of possibly getting sick or dying from the vaccine and getting sick unvaccinated and dying from the COVID, I think your risks are better getting vaccinated. And I would say to people in Tobago and people all over Trinidad and Tobago, but I'm talking Tobago now because I see the cases rising there. Please get the vaccine and protect yourselves and your family and your small communities in which you live and prevent the spread in the island of Tobago. Um, then I, the other item that uh, Chanel uh, shared with you in the news, which I have an interest in, is the issue of the rollout of vaccines for schools that is pending. Chances are that will happen based on uh, the the articulation of the Minister of Health that may happen next week. And I'm sure when the Minister meets with uh, principals today, as she is scheduled to do, we will probably hear something more about that. Um, we have a scheduled um, conversation with the Minister of Education on Wednesday, and we will talk with her have a conversation with her on what is happening and what is going on in the school. Some time ago, we had a conversation with the head of tutor. It was a good conversation. And um, I'm not sure if tutor and the Ministry of Education have met since that time, but they probably will meet uh, before Wednesday when the minister comes here. So we'll have a little conversation about that aspect as well. The vaccination of the uh, children of school age in the secondary school system uh, is absolutely necessary if we are to get children back to school. And if we are to do this well, it really takes the cooperation of parents it takes the cooperation of teachers. It takes the uh, management and coordination of principals and vice, president, vice principals in the schools to get this right at the school level because a school is like a community, a learning community. And it is important to get this right school by school in order to get it done. I've also seen other reports where um, other stakeholders might be involved. I think the principal, the teachers, the parents are critical, and the other institutions can help, like tutor, if tutor is encouraging about this and supportive, it can be of value. If the PTA, um, Parent Teachers Association of the country, is helpful and supportive, that can be of value. And I see that the government has also asked for support of one kind or another, which may unfold later, from UNESCO, which is the UN arm, uh, which is a UN agency which addresses issues related to children. Um, so I think that it is useful to take a collaborative approach and I hope that the government will take this approach. We have seen how well the private sector, NGO, and government collaboration has worked with the mass vaccination drive. There is vaccine hesitancy, it is true, but that we have seen an improvement in the number of people taking vaccines once people begin to have a choice. So I think that that private sector and um, government collaboration together with the NGOs, because there were many NGOs uh, involved and many private sector in, uh, institutions. I mean, the Walinagar 
the, is run by the NCIC. That's a private sector institution. There were state institutions too, like Napa and Sapa. But um, you know, people really came together. The 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 chambers of commerce, the um, the supermarkets association. Uh, you know, they came together to get this done. And I want to say that they did all of this uh, with private sector funds, you know, they raised money to do this. They didn't get any support from government. So here is an instance of citizens really trying to do right by the population, collaborating with government to get it done. And I hope the government will take the same uh, positive dispositional approach in the education sector to get this done for children. You know, children are smarter than adults in many ways, you know, and I am sure that all of them want to make sure that they are safe. I, sure that, I am sure that these children want to go back to school with their friends um, because the social aspect of schooling is important. I am sure that they would like to be back in the classroom and engaging the teacher and the teacher engaging them. And more than that, being able to talk to their friends across the desk, etc. And these things are important for the education of, of, of um, our young. Education is not just teaching and learning, it is also the socialization and engaging process. And in a learning community, and a classroom is a learning community, children learn from each other. We learn from each other. So one child says something, whether it's right or wrong, another child says something, uh, whether it's right or wrong, and the teacher is then able to, to work it out with them so that all the children in the classroom learn something. So. I want to encourage uh, the government to take a collaborative approach with all the stakeholders in the school system and to get this right, as indeed they have gotten right, the mass vaccination with the private sector and the NGOs. Um, um, we often get things wrong. We don't have to keep getting them wrong. And in this case, vaccinations are very important for the health welfare and security of the population, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and for their sake, if no one's sake, yeah, we should get this one right. So we wish the Minister of Education luck, and we will look forward to, we look forward really to talking with her um, in a few days uh, in the middle of next week. Right now, we have a very important person uh, to talk to, a member of the <clears throat> opposition bench, and we will be talking to him just this minute. And this is Mr. David Lee, Dr. David Lee. Um, and we will be talking to him about the energy sector and other things, okay? Because he has varied interests and people want to know um, what their parliamentarians are thinking about and what they're worrying about and what they are passionate about. So let's uh, welcome uh, Dr. Lee. <clears throat> good morning, you. David. How are you? Are you here? I'm good, Dr. Bo. It's a pleasure. A pleasure. I I'm hope you're hearing me properly. Are you? Yeah, I'm hearing you now, and I'm going to turn the volume up by you so that or listeners and our okay. um, viewers can hear better. So could we turn the volume up for him? Um, so let, let's, um, let's start by talking a little bit about energy. And mm -hmm. I would ask you a, a simple question on the energy front. Um, are are things going well in energy from your point of view? And um, what, are, what are the big problems that we are facing in energy that have implications for the national economy from your point of view? 
All right. Let me, let me start off. Good morning again, Dr. Bo. It's a pleasure being on your show. Um, I, li- I like your tagline, the brighter morning with Bo. Um, and to all your viewers and listeners out there, it's a pleasure being on with you this morning. Let me get right into your, the question that you have asked, and which is a, a very critical question given the times that we are in in our country and what we are facing um, economically-wise. Uh, the energy sector, as you well as you will be well aware, Doctor Bo, has is the back, is really the driver of our economy, based on how um, our product, our revenue mixes. So, so the the driver of our economy and the and this high standard of living that we have all enjoyed as a population for a number of years has been solely driven by the energy sector which will then uh, dovetail into other aspects of the economy, construction, um, the retail sector, manufacturing, et cetera. Um, But the main driver of our economy, as you would be well aware, and and your viewers would be well aware, has always been our energy sector. And I don't see that changing anytime soon because we talked about diversification and and whatever administration that, that has been running the country in the past and basically diversification has been a word that has been bandied about it sounds good when budget time comes around um, but truly diversification has not really happened in our country so we are solely dependent on our energy sector what has been happening in the last six years under this this present government has been a decline and really i would say a, a, a contraction of our energy sector and some people might say a decimation of our energy sector because our oil production is down our gas production has been way down um, for, for, for the first time in many many years and over the last six years this present government budget after budget has only been as the, as we always say just all talk about the energy sector you would have seen, and the public would have been well aware, and you, Dr. Bo, I mean, we have worked together for the last five years between 2015 to 2020, and you are well aware that what has been happening in our energy sector with the, with, with the gas production, which is gas production is the driver, um, no longer oil, but we depend, we depend heavily on the revenues from the, from the gas production side. And, and that really drives, according to the Minister Imbert, it, it really depends three quarters of our revenue comes from gas production. And one of the telling tales about this whole energy sector is that over the last six years, you would have seen the, 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 the shutdown and the temporary closures. Some might be permanent, some might be short term of the Point Lisa's industrial estate which again is a driver of our economy and our forex, our forex um, foreign exchange earners. And they have been literally um, at the brink of, of, of disaster over the last four years. So this energy sector decline did not start during COVID period. It started before March, 2020. And, it, and now we are seeing the, the we are now uh, seeing the hardship um, fast track because of, of the, this global pandemic that, that we are experiencing in our country as well as the world. And um, so that the energy sector it leaves much to be decided by this government. Again, it's, it's it, every budget they would promise um, issues uh, for what they would do with the energy sector, budget after budget for the last six years. I, I have no doubt coming on this budget that is due sometime at the either the end of September or the first week in October. Again, it will be just promises again within the energy sector. And what have, one would have remembered that, that really and truly, uh, we have problems in our energy sector. Um, Petrotrain was shut down, as you well aware, in November, the end of November 2018. We, were, we had fuel security on our own where we used to produce our own fuel. And now we are dependent on the international market where we import fuel. So that's another drain on our foreign exchange. And, and the list goes on with the energy sector. 
So really and truly, we have a new Minister of Energy and, and Minister Young. Um, he, I know he was on your show sometime last week and he talked about, you know, positivities. And, and I, I mean, I really hope as, a, as, a, as we as a country, you know, we, we really hope that this government under the new Minister of Energy can, can bring his, his, um, his skills to, to excite the energy sector because as you well aware, Dr. Bo, our foreign direct investment has been gone, has, has, is really in a negative position. Uh, we have not been getting foreign direct investments in this country over the last six years. So there's a slew of, of, of issues that our energy sector drives our country, drives the economy, and, and gives us the kind of standard of living that we all enjoy in our country. And that has been eroding at a very fast pace. Okay, so we have the problem of production in oil. We have the pro pro production of not being able to meet our requirements in natural gas on the production side. And we have the problem of price fluctuation since the dip, the dramatic dip in the price of oil and gas in, um, 20, at the end of 2014. 14. Um, so, but are those the big, are those the big problems in energy, or are the problems in energy bigger than that? Well, it, 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 the drivers of gas production, our gas production has been declining, as well as you, as you, as you rightly said, since the end of 2014, the prices have been also declining. Um, we now see an uptick in the price of oil where I think today is about seventy-one dollars a barrel it for Brent yeah. and it fluctuates. So but but the but really and truly the energy companies under this administration have not been getting the incentivization to be able to go out and invest in our country and try to find more oil uh, oil and gas because of the lack of incentivization. Under the last Minister of Energy um um, God rest his soul, um, Franklin Khan, you know, again, it was about lack of incentivization to the energy sector. And they talk about incentivizing the, the energy sector, but it has not come to fruition. Um, they tried a shallow bid wrong that failed. I understand listening to this new Minister of Energy, Minister Young, he's talking about a deep water shallow bid wrong again. But if you do not incentivize the energy companies, like what under the PP government, which you were part of, um, Dr. Bo, because of those incentivizations that you all did between 2010 and 2015, is really and truly what kept our country afloat in the energy sector between 2015 to 2020. And with all those um, incentives that we had put in place back in, in 2010, 2015, the country would have been a far worse position as far as gas production. So that there are a lot of issues and spin off because of the point Lisa's industrial estate lacks the, the, the because of bad negotiation, lacks the, the, the proper gas supply that they require. And that is why you see in a, a, a shutdown of companies. And when you have a shutdown of companies, you have a layoff of employees. You have a, a you know, all the ancillary industries that depend on these um, point Lisa's industries. They, they also have employees. So it's a whole domino effect that has been happening in the energy sector negatively um, for the past six years. Yeah, the problem of investment that you raise is important because a lot of the gas, even that gas, even the increased gas that we expect uh, in 2022 and possibly 2023, uh, will really come out of investment decisions that were taken in 20. 12, 13, and 14. Correct. Uh, that is correct. And the, the government uh, of the day uh, and the ministers of energy have not been um, successful in bid rounds. One was a joint bid by Shell and BP, and that has gone nowhere because of basically yeah. lack of decision. Um, so the investment uh, for the future um, is a challenge. I want to concede that. 
and um, the I tried to to address some of that with Mr. Minister Young, but we didn't get to the issues there. Um, but one of the things he said, you know, when he was here, was that he had settled um, the contractual arrangements Contracts. with um, the major methanol companies and that those contracts that they did not settle yet were in negotiations and they were going to do them, uh, complete them. And although they will not be getting all the gas that they need because of the short supply, they will be getting enough to do it at a time when commodity prices are relatively high. Does that give you any comfort? Not, not really, um, Dr. Bo. Let, let, me, let me backtrack a little bit. And, and when you, you, you talked to Minister Young last week, and he, and he raises this issue about um, contract negotiations with the Point Lisa Industrial Estate and the players there, um, one of his, his, uh, his narratives has always been that when the PP government was in place, we allowed these contract negotiations to to drag on and not put the proper negotiations in place between when we were um, running the country between 2010 and 2015. And I want to say, firstly, and I want to put it out there, that, that that is not true, because that's the narrative that this government has been putting out, that the PP government has been, you know, allowing these contracts to drag on and not negotiate it. Um, it is there, as you re well aware, Dr. Bo, in the Hansard in our parliament, where Senator Wade Mark had squarely put a question to, the, to Franklin Khan at the time, who was the Minister of Energy, about that same issue about these contracts. And I want to say to, to the public here this morning, and it is there in the Hansard, when that question was posed, and the question was really, and I will precede it, to the uh, Minister Khan, who was the Energy Minister at the time, how many contracts has expired and this was question was asked in 2017 thereabout how many contracts were expired as at the ending of uh, as at september 2015 and this is the point lisa industrial estate and the question and the answer that uh, minister can give his response was one contract had expired as at the ending of september 2015 we were out of government at the ending of September 2015. And then he also, with, with um, Senator Marks, also asked how many other contracts during the period of 2015 to 2019, which is, which is the, the, when the present government was in, is in charge. And he is, and Minister Khan is saying, approximately five to six contracts had expired. So, these contracts had expired and needed renegotiations underneath the present PNM government, under the present regime that is that, that Minister Young is now in charge of the Minister of Energy, as Minister of Energy. So those contracts had to be renewed and negotiated by this present government between 2015 to 2019. Those contracts had expired, and some more might have been expiring. That is why we have the whole issue at the point Lisa's industrial estate. And maybe it's because of the, the um, <clears throat> coming out of those Houston negotiations that back in 2017, that Minister Young was part of a delegation with the prime minister when they went to Houston and renegotiated prices from the upstreamers that is affecting the downstreamers as far as getting a, a, a supply of gas and at a, at a fair market price that allows the, allow them to be able to run the different companies on the Point Lisa Industrial Estate. So that listening to Minister Young now saying that um, contracts have been negotiated or renegotiated, from my understanding, those contracts that have been renegotiated are short term, and some of the companies that will offer the short term contracts um, are not in favor of, of doing short term contracts because they would not be able to plan in the, for their, you know, their viability in, in their medium and long-term outlook as running a company. So the short-term is, is a quick fix for, for Minister Young, 
but that does not augur well for running a company that, the, that these Pointe industrial estate companies depend on a longer term contract so that they can financially plan for the future um, with a secured price. So these are the issues that are happening in the energy sector, especially Point Lisa's industrial estate. All right. So you, you are saying that the contracts that uh, Minister Young talks about are short-term contracts, and therefore there's a problem there. And we'll try to get some of the leaders of the companies in Point Lisa's to talk to us and explore what is happening from their point of view as well, because we intend on this show to give every stakeholder an opportunity. Minister Young did not, when he came here, quarrel about um, the issue of responsibility for the contracts. He simply said that they had done it. But I do take the point that the narrative of the current government has been that we were late in negotiating contracts and left it for them and so on. And, but that matter is settled now, and I would like to focus on the on the um, on the future and i want to ask you the question i mean give me all the things that are you saying one of the things that are wrong one of the things that is wrong uh, is the fact that the companies have short-term contracts which from their point of view are not sustainable and that will not do um, can the energy sector be put right and what what do you think needs to be done to put it right I, um, and that's a, that's a good question, Dr. Bo. The energy sector, which is the lifeline for our economy and is not going to go away anywhere soon, um, can be put right. It really takes the, the will of the administration. It, they, I mean, when you look at the players, the energy sectors in our country and have been here for so, so long, um, going back to Amoco, which is now BP, you have Shell, you have EOG, et cetera. They, they, have, they have been in our country. Um, they have developed and coming out of their, their presence in our country for years and years. We have, they have developed a, we have developed a very healthy and dynamic service sector um, with a lot of local content. So the, the, the energy sector can be put right. I think what requires is, is proper incentivization and not just talk about it happening with this present government that has not happened. The, the second area they should be looking at, at, at giving out more acreage and bid rounds and really doing proper bid rounds and proper deep water um, bids. Um, and really, and also the other aspect is gas utilization, uh, Dr. Bo. We have, before we demitted office in 2015, our last Minister of Energy, and, and you might have been part of that, we, we produced a gas master plan. And up to, to date, um, no one has understood with under this regime this gas master plan or even if it needed tweaking you could have tweaked it at least present to the public the gas master plan that the country is heavily dependent on so we, we in you know in answer in final to your question it can be put right uh, it really needs the will and the and and the and proper negotiating skills and really openness by this administration Go ahead, Dr. Bo. Yeah. Can we get the clip from Minister Young on the policy um, issue? And we will have uh, Dr. Lee speak to that. Um, sure. The, the, because the policy questions are key, in my view, um, because you have two problems, three problems, really. If you have a situation where you are short of oil, and natural gas, and the price is a problem for revenue, uh, you still have the policy question of where you're going to put the gas that is available because you don't have enough for both the downstreamers and Atlantic LNG train one. So that's the first policy decision and, and question, question and decision. The second issue is that the, the companies in Trinidad and Tobago are global companies and they have a global agenda which has shown a change of heart because the world is transforming so that they are now going into um, renewable energy and sustainable energy and basically moving away from fossil fuels. So their appetite 
um, in the long term for investment is different. And the third issue is, I think the revenue situation that faces us in energy tells us that we cannot sustain ourselves um, given the trajectory for the energy sector anymore and diversification is an imperative. So those, the policy questions are really the hard questions that we have to answer. So I'm going to show what Minister Young says. I will ask you to respond and take into account the three issues that I just mentioned, okay? Mm -hmm. yes. Sure. Point leases that was, we were hearing a lot of disruption, a lot of um, noise, as I put it, a noisy narrative. 12 months ago, you're not hearing that. So I want the people of Trinidad and Tobago to understand why. The plants in Point Lisas right now are doing tremendously well. They have the gas supply for them both. Maybe not their full DCQs, but they have their DCQ, their contracted DCQs. You know why? Because last year in April, last year in March, when COVID hit and they were already facing a downward decline on commodity prices, you're looking at ammonia and methanol prices at about 200 US per metric ton. You know what they are today and for the last couple of months, why we're not hearing noise? Ammonia has been over 500 US to over 600 US in that range. In fact, in the last two weeks, it's gone up to 685 a metric ton. So when you have those global prices, you hear no noise from Point Lisa. They're taking all of the gas they have, their full amounts, they're not leaving NGC with any, and they're producing the ammonia and they're selling it very quietly, very happily, making their, their profits as they should. Methanol is the same thing. Methanol has been over $350 up to $380 per metric ton. So you're not hearing that noise anymore. So that's what people need to understand. So when... When you hear detractors talk about, oh, you're shutting down Point Lisa's plants are closing, that is not, don't let, don't be pulled into the gas supply conversation. Right now, you're not hearing any noise because they're getting the prices that they want on the global markets, extremely high prices. So they're quietly taking the gas, they're making their products, they're selling it, and they're making a lot of money. And, and that is what you face in the energy sector. Yes, there has been a lower gas production. And I don't want to get into the blame as to where this is and, and that political rubbish rantings, as I call it, of, of, of some politicians as to who is to blame, etc. <clears throat> the point I just made is, excuse me, for gas production, you need to negotiate contracts today for the future. Bo. It is not as simple as you go and you negotiate a deal today with BP or Shell and the gas production starts tomorrow. There is a lead time of a minimum of three years for the smaller projects. Some of the bigger projects could take up to five to ten years. So if persons didn't negotiate those gas production contracts, not a single gas production contract negotiated in a, in a period of time, then those are the effects we're facing now. And as I said at the outset, we are a maturing province. So that, that policy is not really a policy. The difficulty that you face with less gas being available, there are going to be some fallouts. We have been in very... All right. Okay. Yeah, Dr. Kong. All right. Okay. So, well, I mean, the issue of the contracts, you dealt with. So I don't think we need to go there again. Well, um, listening but... to Minister Young yeah. um, and his comments there, is nothing new that, that Minister Young has said there that has not was not has not already been put out either by him or or his predecessor franklin can um the, the the history is there to show that the point leases industrial estate all of last year even parts of early parts of this year were in in sh were, were shutting down now if their prices of ammonia and methanol is on the uptick that augurs well not only for, for those companies but it augurs well for our country yeah. Because we would then enjoy the, the tax revenue and the foreign exchange that is generated by an uptick of the prices of, of ammonia and methanol. So that augurs well for our country. Nothing, nothing is wrong with that. I am happy if the, if the prices of ammonia and methanol is, is, is increasing because it, it, it redounds to the benefit of the, of, of, of the Minister of Finance because you will get revenues from, from it and the population will also be able to, to assist with our 
um, the deficits that we have incurring year upon year for the last, especially in the last six years. So but that's a given. No, but in that policy decision, though, he didn't mention what? the fact that in a fundamental way, the decision about Atlantic Train 1 has been made well, for... when you look made, at... It has been made for us by BP, so we cannot pursue that anymore. Although well, we have well, one has to ask. A lot no, but one has there. to ask. Okay, so one has to ask as a policy decision, Doctor Bo. Let us take Atlantic, Atlantic Train One, where BP was a major shareholder of Atlantic Train One, and they had said to the government months ago, months ago, that they 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 did not have the gas to supply that Train One. NGC spent over two hundred and fifty million dollars in Train One, and that's a policy decision by the government via NGC to invest two hundred and fifty million dollars in train one. Today train one is still shut down. Where they're going to find gas to supply train one is still up in the air. So even that as a policy policy decision um does not I mean did not pan out in the way they had expected. Right? So that so when you look at that as a policy decision, it has right now it has it has not born any fruition and given they spent 250 million dollars in such a hard time they would have they would have known what they were doing but it didn't bear any fruits at this point in time so even their policy decisions dr bo it, it leaves much to be desired so we are saying i am saying that they require really a will and proper proper expertise um to revitalize our energy sector and, and really and truly, the, the, if you remember, Dr. Bo, when you we went to Houston and, and the Prime Minister, even Minister Young, talked about, you know, not allowing these global players to get their pound of flesh from our country, right? And, and we had to stay strong. Now, these players have put, put us on a, on a map. They have invested heavily in our country. We depend on them for more foreign direct investments. Our service sectors, which, which is vibrant and has been vibrant, depend on them. And we really need to, to, as a policy, to really negotiate maybe better than what has been happening in the last six years with these energy companies. So, so it, is, it, is, it, is, it is not any earth-shattering thing. I, I, I think it's really... The policy of the day, our, I mean, you know our policy when we were there was to, to, to do more incentivization, offer more acreage, um, proper gas utilization, and really negotiate in a more friendlier or a more, you know, a more friendlier atmosphere because we depend on each other. And, and, and I'm happy that ammonia prices and, 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 and methanol prices are up because that augurs well to assist this country in bringing a, a, a less deficit or a burden on the population. All right. Now, one of the, I mean, clearly we can, we have to do our best with energy. We have some hard policy choices. But, um, oh, I'm sorry, we, Doctor, let me interject yes, something. We, you, you had mentioned as a thing to, to look at diversification. And in my opening remarks, I talked about diversification. Now, diversification, as you well aware, Dr. Bo is a past minister of planning, um, diversification takes time. And, and, and all administrations, we talk about diversification. And really and truly, uh, we have not done anything about diversifying our economy away from oil and gas, or even have a, a better mix uh, of, 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 of revenue earners. Um, um, so that really needs a proper discussion again, but that will take time. So in the short term to medium, we will still will be dependent heavily on our energy sector um, to maintain the standard of living and the expenditure that we require to run this country so that, that we still in the short and, and medium term depend, it will be heavily dependent on, on, on our energy sector. And that is why it is so critical that, that the government of the day really have a, you know, work and have a better negotiations or, or better policy decisions um, with our energy players in Trinidad and Tobago. Because if you do not have a friendly atmosphere, what happens? Your foreign direct investments will suffer.
because nobody will want to come into our country because it's an unfriendly atmosphere uh, when it comes to negotiating with the government. Well, I think we have a more serious problem because, uh, first of all, we cannot do Atlantic Train 1 and, uh, and um, downstreamers um, together. So the government has made a policy choice about downstreamers. Um, it may be a temporary policy choice because of the short-term contracts, and we will explore that some more. But there is another issue, which is that those plants, are they competitive when the price is lower? Can they compete on the world market when the price is lower? Or can they only compete when the price is high? So the hard policy choices within energy are harder than I think that we are trying to make out. And I think it's important for the population to understand that. But the second issue, you raise the issue of diversification. And in the businesses that we have now, we have a crisis in the small and medium-sized sector. I'm not talking about energy now. I'm talking about the business sector outside of energy. Do you think the government has done enough to address that? Recently, there was a little quarrel between the smaller chambers and the, um, the Minister of Trade about how many businesses are not going to reopen and how many businesses have collapsed and so on. And the minister was questioning the figures. I don't know that the government has any better figures because we don't have any documentation from the government or any of its agencies on these matters. Um, so what is your view about this? And this is the last question I'm going to have to go to the news, so keep it tight and short. Yeah, sure. Well, well, in a quick, in a quick way, our small and medium businesses over the last, since March 2020 to now, um, under this, it leaves much to be said. A lot of those, I, I consider myself to be a, a medium businessman, and, and a lot of my businesses have shut down. Um, and if you go through the malls, um, Dr. Bo, you would see the amount, the, the many closures that has happened uh, within our major um, shopping malls, uh, and they are not going to come back. And, and because, because of lack of incentivization or lack of, of, of initiative by this government, because the Minister of Finance talked about a small business facility, and, and, and he has made that so onerous, and, it, and, and that a lot of people have not accessed it, and also the, even the, the unknown on, uh, or, or of whether or not if you start back your small business, whether or not, given the, the pandemic situation, if you're going to go back into a shutdown. So because of the lack of confidence and the lack of unknown, a lot of people now, we know Monday is supposedly supposed to restart at the retail sector. A lot of people are still unsure whether or not they have the where it all, the will and the energy to restart those small and medium businesses come Monday. Um, so I would not be surprised come Monday if, if that still holds true um, by the Prime Minister that the retail sector is going to be reopened. You will see a lot of small and medium businesses not opening their doors because the rent still is due over the last three or four months. Um, salary grant reviews have not been paid that, that was promised to many of the workers that are employed in, this, in the retail in the retail sector, a lot of the uh, of the employees have not gotten anything from this government. They are filed, um, so the it, it 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 is it is very difficult for small and medium to restart on Monday, and that is why you know we have a concern and and the numbers are we don't have a proper number of how many businesses will close or have closed, but it's a sizable amount, and you will see it. You just you just have to walk through. Any of the large shopping malls, you have to just have to drive through all of the major cities or, or, or uh, communities, and you see a lot of what were commercial buildings are now up for rent. So even that, that uh, is a telling sign of the small and medium, which is the driver again of our economy, which is one of the highest employers of our of of, of, of the country. Uh, um, it, it it has been decimated because of lack of 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 of, of proper incentivization again 
our proper willpower or pro proper lack of information, um, whether or not you have the energy to restart your business come Monday. Because we have, we have seen it, we did it last year in the, in the closed shutdown. We had a, a sort of a temporary shutdown, and now we had a, a shutdown for the last three, three and a half months. We have had the retail sector has been closed. So it is very difficult for the small and medium to be able to restart to finance their rent that is owing and even to pay off their loans that is owing. And um, so it's, it's very difficult for the small and medium. So you're going to have a lot, in my view, a lot of people are going to be out of work, um, sadly. And I really hope that the government takes this into consideration. All right. Thank you for your um final um, thoughts and comments there on the small and medium business sector. Uh, Dr. Lee, I want to thank you very much for coming on the program and talking about energy a and pleasure. also small business. Um, perhaps on another occasion we could continue this discussion on this and other things. And um, I, want to, um, I want to thank you for your the articulated positions and your thoughts on what the situation is in the energy sector and what we might do in certain sectors to make things a little better. Um, good morning to all of you. I hope you enjoyed the interview. We have to move on now. It is close to seven. And here is Chanel Alceran with the news.